Uh, allow us to start by paying our respects to Dr. Karan Singh, to my colleagues, the head of UNESCO, Shigiru, to my very good friend, the head of UNICEF, Louise George, and a warm welcome to all of you. My name is Lise Grande. I am the head of the 28 United Nations agencies that have the privilege of working in India. On behalf of the UN family, we are honored to welcome you to this month's United Nations public lecture. It is my privilege to salute and to welcome Dr. Karen Singh, of course, a member of the Raja Sabha and one of India's most distinguished leaders, scholars, and intellectuals. In celebration of the United Nations commitment to education for all, Dr. Singh is honoring us and the idea of universal education by speaking today on the theme of education in the 21st century. We have the honor of inviting Dr. Singh to deliver this lecture. He is the representative of India on UNESCO's executive board and has also been a member of UNESCO's International Commission on Education in the 21st Century. Dr. Singh was the youngest cabinet minister when he joined the Union government in 1967. He has held the tourism and civil aviation, health and family planning, and the education and culture portfolios in the Indian government, and also served as the ambassador to the United States. Dr. Singh has been the chancellor of Banaras Hindu University, Jammu and Kashmir University, and JNU. In 2005, Dr. Singh was conferred the Padma Bibhushan, the highest civilian award in India. Of the eight goals that make up the Millennium Development Goals, which were agreed by world leaders 14 years ago, the target of achieving universal primary education has been incorporated into virtually every single development plan in every single country in the world. This is the goal that has fired the international imagination. Global progress in reaching this goal has been tremendous. With one year left before the MDGs expire in 2015, 90% of children around the world now attend school. And in virtually all regions of the world, gender parity in primary education has been or will shortly be reached. One of the great achievements of the MDGs is the fact that children now everywhere enter primary school. This wasn't true 14 years ago, but it is true now. This extraordinary success has been possible because of countries like India. The world will achieve the Millennium Development Goal of primary education because India and other countries have achieved nearly universal primary enrollment, and as many girls go to primary school in India as do boys. India's commitment to education is recognized around the world. India has one of the largest school education systems and has adopted right to education legislation that recognizes education as a fundamental human right. There are still challenges. An estimated 8 million children between the age of 6 and 13 are out of school. More than 40% of children drop out before reaching class 8. Troublingly, a large percentage of these are girls. Prime Minister Modi is calling for action to change this, for example, by installing toilets for girls in schools so they don't have to leave. The UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon has made Education for All a major global campaign. He's called on countries around the world to help make sure that the 57 million children who are out of school go to school and to help the 250 million children who cannot yet read, write, or count well become fully literate. The campaign is known as the Global Education First Initiative, and it's one of the things that the Secretary General is proudest of. In India, the Global Education First Initiative is led by UNESCO and UNICEF. Allow us to salute the work of Shigiru, the head of UNESCO, and Louis Georges, the head of UNICEF, who support the government of India to implement the right to education and who facilitate the UN's efforts to promote the Global Education First Initiative. It is our privilege to now invite Dr. Karn Singh to deliver the UN lecture.
whole gamut of educational issues. But what I would like this evening briefly to speak about is to share with you the concept of the four pillars of learning that we had identified. We had identified four pillars of learning and I'll go through them briefly and give you some of my perceptions with regard to them. The first uh, pillar is learning to know. The Jnana Yoga. Ano Bhadra Kritvo Yantu Vishwata. Let noble thoughts come to us from every side. There's a massive explosion of information now, doubling every five years. And there is, from this avalanche of information, we have to extract knowledge, construct knowledge. And from knowledge, we have to distill wisdom. That is how we've got to. Otherwise, we'll get lost in this ocean of information around us. So from information we've got to construct knowledge, from knowledge we've got to distill wisdom. Otherwise we'll be just washed away by our, our own technological ingenuity. There are many stories in human history of how technology has come to a sorry end. The island of Atlantis which we come across in Plato, glittering with all the great achievements of that age, is said to have sunk below the waves one night unable to survive its own technological ingenuity. The, uh, the great ship, the Titanic, supposed to be unsinkable. The great pride of our technologists and of our scientists and of our elite, on its very first journey, it came across something which was from nature, an iceberg, and sank to the bottom of the sea. So mere technology, howsoever great, howsoever extraordinary, and it is extraordinary, there's no doubt, our, um, our satellite is now circling Mars. But it is not enough. We also have to learn about values, about, about the deeper influences that we need to develop. So, of course, all the mathematics and physics and chemistry and history and geography that I learned at school are out of date now. But we've got to keep learning. Learning is a lifelong process. It's one of the insights of, the, of the, this uh, report. And this report, interestingly, it's called Learning the Treasure Within. Learning is something is developing the inner, the inner um, potentialities of the human spirit. And you can, le you can learn, um, continue to learn all your life. On my 80th birthday, if you please, uh, my grandchildren gave me my first iPad. I was computer illiterate, I still am. I've written 20 books without using a computer, but they won't believe it, you know. Nowadays, youngsters will not believe that you can actually do something without a computer. And now I've, I didn't know how to use that iPad. It took me a month to learn how to put it on and another month to learn how to put the rigid thing off. But nonetheless, now I play bridge and I play Scrabble and I play uh, chess with it. And you know, it's, it's a learning experience. So you're never too old to learn and never too young to learn. In our tradition, as you know, the learning began, begins in the womb of the mother. And now scientists are beginning to realize 
that the sort of vibrations that the story of Abhimanyu, for example, who learnt when he was still in his mother's womb. And therefore, learning is a lifelong experience. And uh, it is therefore very important that learning to know, we must have questioning minds. Young people must respect teachers but mustn't necessarily accept all that they say. They must question, question, question. We are in the, in the East, we are a dialogic civilization. We are not a revealed civilization. Here is a text, take it or leave it. We are a dialogic civilization. The Upanishads are dialogues. The Gita is a dialogue. Little like the Platonic Socratic dialogues. So the dialogue is very important. And the, the, the student is as important as the teacher. Because if you don't ask intelligent questions, you won't get an intelligent reply. And therefore learning to know involves not only the capacity to, to absorb knowledge, but the capacity also to, uh, to ask questions and to challenge uh, established notions. That's the first pillar, learning to know. The second pillar is learning to do, the karma yoga as it were. Unless education also gives us the capacity to do something, to do some productive activity, it really becomes meaningless. In India, uh, this mismatch between uh, learning to know and learning to do has caused massive educated unemployment, jobs are not available, and many of the educated become unemployable. And there's a strange notion, uh, at least uh, in some countries, that it is not the done thing for educated people to do manual work. And that is ridiculous. There's a book called The, the Ambidextrous Universe by, by Gardner. And he has a marvelous sentence there where he says that a society that values philosophy because it thinks it's a noble profession and looks down on plumbing because it thinks it's a lowly profession will have the worst of both worlds, neither its pipes nor its theories will hold water. And therefore, the, the, the idea that, you know, and everybody, that's why I feel that what we have to do is to move massively into technical education. We have marvelous IITs, but where are the ITIs? We need literally thousands of industrial training institutes where young men and women can learn how to do something. We can put a, 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 a satellite around Mars, but you can't get anybody to repair your television set, at least not in Delhi. So, you know, this is a strange thing. See, even simple tasks uh, are, are sort of, you know, not available because people are not trained. Everybody cannot become a nuclear scientist. Everybody cannot become a space engineer. But everybody must be able to do something useful. And therefore, this gap, I feel, can be filled now with innovative technologies and distance education and so on, open schools and universities. This gap can be filled by this intermediate area between uh, secondary education and higher education. And at least uh, we must have large numbers of, of training institutes uh, because learning to do also needs an attitude towards work. Uh, the Gita, for example, stresses yoga karmasu kaushalam. Yoga is, is skill in works. It's not just some slipshod work that you can do just because you're doing something. Something that needs to be done with a certain dedication, with a certain devotion. I am a worshipper of Shiva. Yat yat karma karo me tatta takhilam shambho tavaradhanam. Whatever one does, one tries to dedicate to the divine or to whatever you like or to your own prophets if you like. But you have to do it in a dedicated manner. And therefore, regardless of what the work is, the attitude towards work is also important. So learning to do is not simply learning to do, but it's learning to do it with a spirit. There's a story of... Um, Rajaraja Chola, the great Tamil emperor, he was building the, the Bhredishwara temple, which is probably the greatest temple in India, a thousand years ago. And he went out one day to inspect uh, the work. And he came to a man who was cutting stone. And he asked him, what are you doing? He said, sir, I'm cutting stone. He went a little further, there was another man who was also cutting stone. 
He asked him, what are you doing? He said, I'm earning a living. He went to the third person, asked him, what are you doing? He said, sir, I'm building a great temple. So they were all doing the same thing. But one was doing it merely mechanically. The other at least had some broader vision he was earning. The third one knew that he was building the greatest temple in India. So the attitude with which you do also is tremendously important. That's our second pillar. The first pillar is learning to know. The second pillar is learning to do. The third pillar is learning to live together. The Jnana Yoga, the Karma Yoga, the Saha Yoga. Learning to live together. There are beautiful verses in the Vedas. Sahana Vavatu, Sahana Uvaraktu, Sahiviryam Karvavahi, Tejasvina Vadhita Mastu Bhavidvishavahi. Let us work together, let us think together, let us achieve together. Let there never be any hatred between us. This is a prayer 5,000 years old. And here I think it's tremendously important that when you learn to live together, the concept of Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world as a family, is a very ancient concept in India. Vasudha Eva Kutumbakam, the world itself is a family. And uh, that is the basis, has to be the keynote of the emerging global society. But learning to live together involves a value system without which it cannot become a reality. And I have identified five sets of values which I think are essential if we are going to live together in peace and harmony. The first set of family values, courtesy, consideration for elders, solidarity, helpfulness. You know, uh, in India parents tend to be too possessive. They think that they can run their children's lives, they can't. As Khalil Gibran says, your children come through you but do not belong to you. So therefore, we have to be, we have to, we have to be more relaxed. Children on their part also have to realize that the elders must have something to teach them. Howsoever computer illiterate they may be, uh, they have something to teach them and they can learn. So the relationship, the family relationship revolves around these two poles, the, the parent-child relationship and the husband-wife relationship. Now in the husband-wife relationship, uh, the old uh, custom in the east of the woman walking three paces behind the man is ridiculous and almost as ridiculous is the strange western custom of the woman walking, walking three paces ahead. <laughs> what is really required is, is, is to walk together, co-sharers in the great adventure of living. Ardhangini, that is why the great Shiva Shakti image of, of the male and the female uh, fused together. I must tell you a story about, about this uh, walking. There was somebody, I won't mention the name of the country because I'll get into trouble. Where he was, somebody from the U U United Nations was posted there. Or UNESCO or UNICEF or whatever. And there he found that uh, the women used to walk three paces behind the men. So then he was posted out and 10 years later he again posted to the same country. And now he saw that the women were walking three paces uh, ahead. So he says to his friend, he says, you know, I'm very impressed with the social revolution. He says, no, no, there are lots of, uh, we have we had a civil war and there are lots of time bombs lying around. So we thought it's better for the women to go. <laughs> so, that's not the way we want the women to walk ahead. So the first is fa family values. The second is societal values. Cleanliness. We are the biggest clutter bugs in the world. There's so much kachira in India. Wherever you go, wherever there's a corner, there's some kachira there. It is absolutely unacceptable. I've been saying this 20 years before Narendra Modi started saying it. I've said it publicly. You know, it's really a shame. I, I, the other day, I was driving towards, I think I was coming here, and at a crossing, a man with a very smart car put down the window and threw out an empty plastic bottle or something. I mean, you can't do that. In the West, if you do it, you'll be fined. Here, everybody gets away with anything. So cleanliness, shaucha, the Gita, you see, in our ancient tradition, we have all of this. 
The trouble is we've lost it. Shaucha, cleanliness, is one of the great virtues mentioned in the Gita. Punctuality. It's a marvel that we started. Now I have a thing. I'm notorious in Delhi for being fanatically punctual. So whenever I'm invited, we say, oh God, this man is going to turn up in time. Kya kare? Because you know, when I first came here as minister, I'll tell you what happened. I went to a function once, with time written on the card, neither the organizers nor the audience was there. <laughs> I mean, you know, organizers say, no, no, abhi nahi aai, abhi log nahi the people haven't come down, wait, wait, wait. And they tell the minister, the minister, no, no, what can we do, the people haven't arrived. So, you know, I said, I'm not playing this game. I am going to arrive on the dot. Now this is not only me, I mean I'm sure all the young people are very punctual, but I think punctuality is a societal value. And a stress on fundamental duties. You see, everybody stresses fundamental rights. And we are proud of our fundamental rights in our constitution. No doubt about it. They are among the most progressive and the most advanced of anywhere in the world. But how many know and I'm not going to embarrass the audience by asking them to raise their hands. How many know that we also have a set of fundamental duties in the Constitution? Does it, I'm sorry, I don't want you to know. I know you'll be highly embarrassed if I say, please raise your hands, those who do know. And how many of you know how many they were? I was on the drafting committee of the fundamental duties. Sadar so Swan Singh chaired the committee. There are ten fundamental duties in the constitution. Does anybody ever mention them? No, everybody writes. Give me this, give me that, give me this. Fair enough. In a democracy you can demand your rights. But you have to fulfill your duties. That is your societal responsibility. And an overemphasis on rights and a total neglect of duties is a, is a very negative thing from which India has been suffering for many years. And I think that needs to change. If people demand their rights, they've got to jolly well fulfill their duties also. And I'm talking across the board, the whole of the nation, whether they're ministers or whether they're uh, peons, whatever they may be, they've got to do that. That is, a, that is the second uh, set of values. The first, I said, were family values. The second were societal values. The third are interfaith values. I have been involved for 40 years in the interfaith movement. The interfaith movement is a movement designed to bring together in a harmonious dialogue people of different religious faiths. Not in order to argue which is better, which is worse, but just in order to begin to understand. This began in 1893 in Chicago, in the first parliament of the world's religions, which as you know was where Swami Vivekananda made such a dramatic impact. And from then on, in the 20th century, a large number of interfaith organizations have come into being. I chair one worldwide now called the Temple of Understanding. We've had a whole plethora of conferences. We've had parliaments of world religions. We had the second one in Chicago 100 years later, 1993. Third one in Cape Town, 1999. Fourth one in Barcelona, Spain. The fifth one in Melbourne. Sixth one is now going to be held again in, in America. But nonetheless, the, the uh, interfaith movement still has not become central to the human uh, consciousness in the same way as the environmental movement became central. But I do think it's very important. And I do feel that uh, unless we, we uh, introduce uh, this as one of the Millennium Development Goals, as we approach uh, uh, 15 years of the uh, MDP, MDGs, we find that we've achieved 40% of the eight goals. But I find that the missing link in its success has been the exclusion of global understanding and interfaith harmony. Unless there is harmony between the great religions of the world, there will never be peace on earth. And we are seeing that before our very eyes. And therefore, interfaith values, I think, should become part of the curricula. Because we still have countries where the curricula uh, preaches hatred against other religions. I don't want to mention names. I'm sure UNESCO knows about it. You should get hold of textbooks from some countries and see what they have to say about other religions. If children are brought up with negative uh, uh, knowledge about other religions or negative Im uh, indications, then how do you expect them later to become global citizens? They will grow up with hatred and negativity. 
and that is why I think this is a neglected area, if I may submit. Although it's in the in the whole United Nations uh, system and in UNESCO, but it has not received the attention that it deserves. I know it's a very delicate matter, interfaith and who represents the faith and what happens and all. There was a big interfaith and parliamentarian meeting in the United Nations in the year 2000, which the UN Secretary General had called. After that, there was nothing more. So I, I just want to make this and mark this point that interfaith values are very important. Ekam Sat Vipraha Bahuda Vadanti. The Rigved says the truth is one, the wise call it by many names. That basic concept has to be grasped. There can be no monopoly of the divine. Who are we, tiny creatures on a speck of dust in this universe, to lay down that the illimitable splendor of the divine can appear only in this place and at this time and in this form? It's prima facie unacceptable. I can say, yes, for me, my religion is the best. But I cannot say that because you do not follow my religion, you can be blown up or killed or murdered or tortured. So unless we accept multiple paths to the divine, there will never be peace on planet Earth. And I think that this aspect needs to be stressed when we talk of education in the 21st century. The fourth set of values, environmental values. Now, I don't want to go into that. That is a whole world by itself. But uh, global warming is now upon us. The erratic weather patterns that we are seeing, the floods and the droughts. In fact, my own home state has been devastated by, uh, by unprecedented floods. And the rise in temperatures and the rise in the levels of the ocean, we are moving towards an environmental disaster. We may not see it in our lifetime, our children may not see it, our grandchildren may see it. So what are we going to do about it? Do we involve environmental values in our educational system? Do we teach our children that they have to grow up? You know, in the, again going back to the Vedas, there are hymns to the oceans, to the mountains, to the rivers, to the trees, to the animals. Because they realized, those great seers realized, if we, if we destroy the natural environment, we will finally destroy ourselves. And after thousands of years of evolution, we are coming now to the sort of situation where we have succeeded in eliminating thousands of species and this whole climate change now is beginning to catch up with us. You cannot continue to uh, abuse nature without at some point reaping the whirlwind. The Atharva Veda has a marvelous piece, 63 verses called the Bhumi Suktam, Hymn to the Earth. I would request anybody who has the time to read them. That is the most holistic and, and uh, complete statement of environmental values that are found, I think, in any scripture. And therefore, this whole question of environmental values, I was at Stockholm. I was a member of the Indian delegation to the first United Nations Conference on the Human Environment in Stockholm. There were only two Prime Ministers there, Indira Gandhi who led the Indian delegation and Olaf Palme who led the Swedish delegation. And therefore when they talk of Rio plus 20, it's ridiculous. Rio was Stockholm plus 20. Why has everybody forgotten Stockholm? You talk of Rio plus 20 and Rio plus 10 and all. That's ridiculous. It's Stockholm plus 20 was Rio and then more. Oh. So that Stockholm conference, I was there. I've seen this environment movement, environmental develop in my own lifetime. And there are lots of dedicated environmentalists. But nonetheless, the way things are going, we are being overtaken. This is one of those losing battles. And we have to, in our educational system, we have to include environmental values in it. And then finally, the fifth are what I would call values for a global society. I've been talking about that. The fact that we are proud to be Indians, but we are also proud to be global citizens. I think that uh, uh, in, in every passport, it should be India, planet Earth, America, planet Earth, Australia, planet Earth. Let us realize we are a tiny spaceship moving through the, um, through, through outer space. And all of us, if we do not live together, what is the use of talking of a global village if the villagers are in each other's throats? And therefore, global values, the idea that nationalism is good, Everybody is nationalistic, but 
nationalism is not enough. You also need to have a sense of global citizenship. I think the time has now come. People like Rabindranath Tagore saw it 60-70 years ago when he wrote that uh, a love for your country is not enough, you must also love the planet. Let me, uh, and I, let me just mention that the setting up of the UNESCO Mahatma Gandhi Institute of Education for Peace and Sustainable Development in Delhi earlier this year is a significant event and hopefully this will become a center for uh, environmental and sustainable development education. And then the fourth pillar. I talked to the learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, where I've mentioned these values. And the fourth and perhaps most important pillar, learning to be. Now what does that mean, learning to be? Learning to be surely means that we cannot simply skim the surface of life. We have to look within. We have to find there the power and the, and the, and the inspiration to fulfill our potentialities. Francis Thompson has a marvelous poem, not where the wheeling systems darken and our benumbed conceiving soars, the drift of pinions would be hearken, beats at our own clay shuttered doors. The angels keep their ancient places, turn but a stone and start a wing. Tis ye, tis your estranged faces that miss the many splendored thing. The many splendored light of the Atman, what the uh, Bible calls the light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. The Ekumkaras Sikh Gurus, the Ruhani Noor of the Sufis, the, that light, uh, the Bodhicitta of the, of the Buddhists, that light is within us. When the seer of the Upanishad says, Vedaha metam purusham mahantam aditya varanam tamasaparastha. I have seen that great being shining like a thousand suns beyond the darkness. He wasn't looking through a telescope. He was looking within. He was learning to be. The inner quest is in every way as significant as our outer life. And human birth is a unique opportunity for spiritual growth. It is not a meaningless journey from the, from the womb to the tomb. It is a glorious adventure of life. And unless we are able to, and I would particularly talk to these, the young people who are here, you are the ones who have a vested interest in the future. You've got to develop your inner capacities. And you've got to try and see how, as Wordsworth says in one of his poems, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. But remember what Bernard Shaw said, you know what he said about youth? He said, youth is a wonderful thing, what a pity it's wasted on the young. <laughs> so, uh, friends, therefore, this fourth uh, pillar, learning to be, uh, whether you do meditation, prayer, yoga, tai chi, zen, whatever, uh, you have to also, education has to include this. What a deprivation to our young people that we do not even point out to them the various doors that are available. Let them choose what they want to do. But you can go through a whole course of education in India from pre-primary to post-PhD without once hearing about the Upanishads. The great glory of Indian philosophy. India's great gift to the world, the zero and the Upanishad. These are the two great gifts to the world, the Vedanta. But you are not taught, you are not All right, we cannot teach religion in our con because our constitution forbids it. Fair enough. But surely we can teach the major points from the various religions. We can introduce the children to what they are great, great, great thinkers. I don't have time, I have a whole uh, talk on that separately, on how different religions have uh, great uh, insights. Let us at least teach the insights of the great religions to children. Why have we thrown the baby out along with the bathwater? Along with secularism, we have developed a sort of a denial of spiritual growth. And I think this is unfair. I think we are, we are depriving our children and our young people from learning a great deal and from being able to open doors when they grow up into the many different approaches to the divine. So taking together these four pillars, learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, learning to be, the Jnana Yoga, the Karma Yoga, the Sahi Yoga and the Atma Yoga, I think represent what we really want in the 21st century. Friends, ladies and gentlemen, all of us connected with education 
have a grave responsibility for nurturing future generations and for nurturing planet Earth. This Earth that has brought us up from the slime of the primeval ocean four billion years ago to where we are today, that has nurtured consciousness. Remember, remember that great photograph, the great NASA photograph of planet Earth. I think that is the most extraordinary photograph ever taken. No generation before us has ever seen what we actually looked like. That photograph should hang in every classroom in the world. And that shows us as we really are, a tiny speck of light and life against the unending vastnesses of outer space, so beautiful and yet so fragile. This is the mother, Gaya Bhavani Vasundhara, who had nurtured consciousness over all these billions of years and brought us to where we are today. Let us therefore, today, make a pledge to contribute to building a sane and harmonious society in a peaceful and integrated world in the 21st century. Thank you. Dr. Karansen, thank you so much. And then uh, let me express the, our sincere appreciation mm -hmm. on behalf of UNESCO and on behalf of UNC India for your very insightful, but also the very beautiful the lecture given to us. Now, Dr. Karansen the, reflected on the key messages on the, of the Jack Durrell's report, which is still the set for UNESCO to reflect on what should be the post-2015 education agenda. He mentioned about four pillars, learning to learn, sorry, learning to know, learning to do, learning to live together, and learning to be. And one of the most important messages, which is related to the, the Secretary General's the Global Education First Initiative, is learning to live together and learning to be. I understand that the, the general report is a very, very insightful Bible for all of us working in the field of education to reflect on what should be the role of education for the future generation. We are now in the process of the discussing very hardly and then intensively about framing the how should be the uh, education post-2015 and then the, what should the education paradigm shift. <clears throat> and uh, we identified very important role of teachers. In the past, teacher is uh, just a teacher who can transmit the set of knowledges to the learners. But nowadays, we recognize teacher's role is much more important and flexible as a kind of facilitator to facilitate learners to gain knowledge, wisdom, values as well as the skills to cope with the global challenges we are now facing. Well, Dr. Kanachi, thank you so much. And, 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 and I understand that the, the audience, the participants, will have a lot of kind of the questions or comments who are willing to interact yeah. with you around the issue of education in 21st century. I thank you very much once again, and I'd like to kind of invite Liz to moderate the interactive session between the audience and the Dr. Karansi. And last three, the, just in, let me introduce the new publication of UNESCO, which is the Learning to Live Together, the focusing on how we can have harm, harm, harmonious interface dialogue as well as building peace, which is also stemmed from his uh, report in 1996. Thank you so much again. Then this, please. We would be very, we would be very pleased to take any questions from the floor. Madam. May I just sit? Uh, good evening, uh, Dr. Karan Singh. I'm so fortunate to hear you for the first time live. 
I'm an educationist and handle students all the time. I have some questions as um, I think uh, Sir mentioned just now, what are the challenges for the youth now? What are the challenges that I feel that they, have, they should stay positive? There's a lot of burnout and depression among students. They work very hard initially, but at some point, quite early, uh, just after the teenage, Hold the they give up. A little further away. Yes, yes. Uh, I think I keep it like this. Yes. So, um, this is one of the biggest challenges that other youth should remain enthusiastic. Second um, uh, point is related to the topic that how we're going to provide education to all. On the other hand, I've seen the help uh, that comes to my place, I have asked her to bring her children so that I can teach the children. But I have seen these children, they don't want to study. What may be the reason? I think we have to come to this point as well. I think there's one question, but you've already asked two. Sorry, sorry. And one question per person, you've already asked two. I'm Let sorry. Let respond to those. Thank you. Firstly, about negativity, I think you're quite right. I find that uh, there is generally, there is too much negativity uh, in the country generally and people, you know, are becoming cynical and partially it's because of this all-pervasive corruption that is eroding, eroding our lives, eroding our society, eroding our polity, eroding our economy. But I think it's very important, you're right, that young people must keep the flame of idealism burning. If they don't do it, if they allow that flame to be extinguished, then we will never make it. So the teachers really and the parents have got to try and instill in the younger generations the, the hope and the aspirations for the future. That's one of the great tasks. As far as the problem that you say, it's really a problem of poverty. Because the people that you mentioned, they've been so poor that they've never had the opportunity of education. But I find now more and more, uh, whatever uh, class uh, or caste people may be from, uh, they want their children to study. Remember one generation of my employees, they, they're under, under metric. One daughter is doing a PhD, the other is doing an MA. So it's an astounding change that has come about in one generation. And although it may not be universal yet, but there has been a, there's a great quest for education. The first thing people want when you travel are schools. If they have a primary school, they want a middle. If they want a middle, if they want a high school. If they high school, they want a college. College, they want a university. That is the universal quest for knowledge which I find in the country. I have a small question. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm A.K. Merchant. I work in the area of interfaith uh, education. But my specific question is that in India and many developing countries, the quality of teachers who are in the field of education is woefully lacking and inadequate. Yes. On the one hand, you have private schools where you have the best of teachers paid very highly. And of course, it's also commercialized. But on the other hand, where 80% of the children in our country who receive education from government schools, there you don't have teachers who have the right standard Mind of that's quality. That's not entirely true. The Kendriya About Vidyalaya... About developing countries... No, uh, the Kendriya Vidyalaya, yeah. for you. example, are often topping examinations all over the country. So, uh, government schools can be good. Like the Kendriya Vidyalaya, the Sainik schools, the... Um, uh, the Sarvodaya uh, Vidyalaya. It isn't as if all um, government schools are necessary. But I agree in the rural areas particularly, and the Dilor Commission, lay, we laid particular emphasis on teachers training, and not only teachers training at the lower level, but up, a, a steady upgradation of skills. Because as I said, knowledge is going out of, a, out of a circulation in five years. So unless the teachers are updated, they will not be able to uh, give the new knowledge. So teachers training, I agree with you, is a very, very important. And teachers have to go to the rural areas. They cannot be paid and not go to the rural areas, which is the worst form of corruption, I think. Sir. I am Ajit Kumar, founder of Khushi Gram, and we are working in rural areas in eastern India. Uh, so, uh, in the rural areas, we find that people still are uh, trying to follow the system that we have been following. And that's the reason of declining livelihood opportunities as well as broader thinking they had and the kind of systems they had due to which India was, life in India was still sustainable 
we are maintaining our, our environment, keeping our ponds and rivers clean. So we are trying to revive the Gurukul system of education, also integrating with the modern system that we have. So with uh, experiences and we have been listening to you for more than two decades, so many things we are incorporating that we have learned from wise people like you. So do you feel it's sustainable to do that? Thank you. I think it's absolutely necessary to do that. If you don't do that, our whole, our whole uh, uh, educational system is really going to fail. And that is why I made particular reference to the importance uh, not only of the Guru Shishya of the, that system, but also the importance of imparting some kind of technical training, some kind of skills. Skill development is the latest buzzword. And I think that's very important. So organizations like yours that are working in the rural areas can make a very important contribution to the development of India. Ma'am. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Kritika and I work with a non-profit called Prabha. We work with young people and adolescents. Uh, right now, just now we were having a conversation around teachers and teachers training. Uh, and also during uh, earlier, sir had shared that difference between teachers and facilitators. And in fact, my question was around, uh, but the curriculum for teachers really uh, uh, caters to making them teachers and not really facilitators and there's so much that you've just shared that needs to be inculcated in students in children and young people but it's a massive task and uh, it's what, what is the question the question is about presently the curriculum for teachers really caters to yeah. making them teachers and not facilitators I agree. And I agree. so, uh, you know, so what is... We have to revamp, budget? actually, the whole teacher's training concepts in this country have to be revamped along with the educational system. Uh, the, the old system, mind you, is not bad. I am not one of those who trashes Indian education. We wouldn't have uh, produced people when Indians go abroad in the United States, for example. They are at the top of every profession and there are no reservations there whether they're doctors or lawyers or when I went to NASA there were 600 Indians there. So it isn't as if our education doesn't produce good results but unfortunately those results are only at the top of the pyramid. What we really need is to develop the base of the pyramid and that can only be done by proper teachers orientation and uh, new experimentation. The gentleman right here. How do you see it? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Karan Singh. It was a fascinating uh, lecture you have given. Thank you, sir. Uh, insightful. I just want to add to what you said, the, the NASA, uh, the globe picture in every classroom. It's an amazing, uh, I think we need to experiment with that idea. I want to add to that. Uh, we have recently been doing uh, 600 children's libraries. Mm. We set up uh, in uh, two states of Telangana and Andhra Pradesh. Amazing results we found from it. The point that you made, the four points that you made, could be achieved by making children to read. We have identified 650 books made for children, which uh, uh, indicate or uh, provide the insights that you have mentioned from uh, the Vedic uh, uh, source, uh, sources. These books written from out of that. I think uh, they could uh, add a book reading. The point I'm making is a simple point. Making children to read books. Yes. Today could make all the difference. Yes. Um, let me see Thank two you. things. First of all, uh, the Amar Chitra Katha series are really what most children have read nowadays. And uh, they've learned a lot from that. But I find now uh, our grandchildren don't read books any longer. They just look at that machine, you know, the, the computer. You know, um, and the iPad, you know, they, they, don't, they don't read. We buy, by their age, we had read a hundred books. They have not read any of them. They have not read War and Peace. They have not read Jean Christophe. They have not read uh, The Magic Mountain. They have not read, they have not read any of these books. They never heard of them. And they don't read. So, computers are a blessing. But, that should not mean that the reading habit is given up. I entirely agree with you. I am a bibliophile. I love books. I've got 25,000 books which I have myself bought in my lifetime in my museum, in, in my library in Jammu. And books and children's libraries are an excellent idea. And I think that that should be followed up um, by all the states in India. We have the gentleman in the front row and then sir in the middle row. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Karan Singh. Uh, I have a question with respect to lifelong learning. I think uh, 
you know, putting emphasis on right to education, primary education, universalization is all fine. But do you really think we have that much time? The older generation doesn't need to learn a few new tricks and uh, do a few good things to keep corruption in check they do. and to realize their, their own duties. I mean, how can they get away with it? If we just believe that education will solve some problems in the future, what well, the future is now. It's a good point, I must say. Uh, on this question of, of, of uh, elderly people and leaders, uh, there's a marvelous uh, line in the Gita, yat yat acharati shreshtas tattate vizaro ganha so yat pramanam kurute lokas tattanubhatate What the leaders do and how they behave, that is what will be followed by the mass of people. And therefore, uh, I must say that uh, the present generation uh, has, has not been able to provide the sort of role models. For example, my role models when I grew up for politics was Jawaharlal Nehru and for intellectualism was Dr. Radha Krishna. Those were my role models. Now, nowadays I'm afraid we are falling behind and I agree with you that politics particularly has to be, uh, has to be uh, revamped, if I may say so, so that the all-pervasive corruption, not only in politics, but through that around the nation can be brought under control. And we do not have very much time. You're quite right. Sir? Gentleman on the fight shirt. Thank you, Dr. Karan Singh. My name is Tabas Chatterjee. I am working for an NGO called Action in Community and Training. I have a particular question that can we change the system by which the government schools are working because in our country government schools are having nearly 80 percent of the students and those who are poor but i think that we are making and we are continuing to make better among equals if i have money my children will go to good schools and if i don't have money my children will go to government schools whereas in government schools in today's time the salaries are very good yeah. even the teachers are trained they are very much educated, but the outcome is zero. Now, can we make a change in the system by giving reward and punishment, putting the reward and punishment system within it? I have an idea. Can we make one single rule that can change the entire education system in India that all government school staff must make their children study in government schools, any government schools? But all government school children, uh, staff must make their children study in any other government school. Well, it's a good idea, but of course we can't do it because there's a fundamental right to freedom <laughs> in this country. But I agree with you, This uh, there is this problem of, of uh, the lower income people not being able to go to. But I think the idea that public schools are the only good schools and not the government schools, I don't think that is any longer correct. I think we should look a little more closely at our Kendri Vidyalaya network and they are spread around the country and I am sure that the state government, you see remember <coughs> education is a state subject and in a vast federal country like ours unless the state governments also take special interest in upgrading um, edu educational system uh, it won't work. So there is a lot that can be done I agree. The gentleman in the striped shirt and then the gentleman in the orange shirt. Sir, uh, I don't know how you can see anybody. I can't see anybody there. <laughs> Where is the striped shirt? <laughs> you are the striped shirt. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, there is a lot of idealism in your talk and which uh, I agree that uh, there is a very much serious role about idealism. But uh, uh, particularly in one area which uh, slightly I am a lot of uh, anxiety is there is uh, in a global economy particularly when it is interdependent and the question of interdependence is really very serious is it possible that we can have global citizenship or that kind of interdependence mm. where we can really teach everybody global citizenship i well, think that, one of the writers Vigo Parak, he says that we basically what we can have is globally oriented citizenship rather than global citizenship yeah well it's a semantic problem i know lord Parak well he's a very very bright man and uh, well, global oriented citizenship, it cannot really be a global citizenship in the sense that we now have national citizenship. But the, the phrase is simply being used uh, that we, we overcome national barriers. You know what is happening now? The, the 
uh, regional organizations are becoming very important. For example, the European Union. I don't know whether the, the, whether you realize it or not. I, in, in, the European Union is the greatest miracle to take place in human history. The French and the Germans and the British were at each other's throats for a thousand years. Millions of people perished on the battlefields of Europe. And yet today you go, you do not know where France ends and Germany begins. The mark has disappeared, the franc has disappeared, the lira has disappeared, and you just have the euro. This is an astounding development. Anybody of my generation who has seen the wall, who really, it's, it's an amazing thing. So if it can happen there, why can it not happen ultimately in Sark? How long are we going to remain bogged down in our antagonisms and in our, in our um, um, uh, I don't know, I don't want to use a strong word, but uh, in our negative thinking? So therefore, perhaps the first step towards the global citizenship is our regional organizations, ASEAN, the European Union, SARC, and so on. And then gradually we may move in uh, to what uh, uh, Tennyson calls the Parliament of Man, the Federation of the World. And then for our last question, sir. Excuse me, can you please? Thank you, Mr. Kansin. Actually, I would like to focus on two important areas of the education in India. Actually, myself uh, belongs from the rural India and I am doing as per my capacity to development the education in the rural India uh, from UP, Uttar Pradesh. Where is UP? Uh, Barelis. Barelis, yes. Yes, sir. So, uh, the main emphasis is that uh, through the Right to Education Act, as you have mentioned, that we have got the 90% persons enrolled in schools. And that is better for the education. But what I think, we have achieved the 90% schooling, but not the 90% education. There is a difference between the schooling and the education in a country. And also schooling are, doesn't mean education. Also, there are dropouts, mind you. There, lots there is a dropout, and there is a corruption in the education sector from admission to getting the degree mm. in schools, in colleges, and in university. So, there should be a policy initiatives to tackle the corruption in the educational system and uh, apart from that, to define the accountability of the teachers. Yes. Because we have seen that in government schools, in government university, in school, uh, UP, there is a merit system to get the admission in the schools, in the, sorry, uh, College. graduation colleges. And through those merit system, only those person can get admission who are scoring 70%, 75% and when they take the admission, they have cleared their degree, it is shown that they are getting, um, most of them are getting less than 50%. So there should be the accountability of the teachers and the professors uh, of the country. There should be the policy initiatives from the government for that. Yes. Thank you. I agree with you on both points. You're right. Merci beaucoup. Well, I think we're coming to an end to this uh, conversation. Maybe I just to say, want to say a few words. I'm going to get closer in terms of concluding. Uh, I think Dr. Oh, Dr. Yes, um, Karan Singh um, have given us a, lo a lot of wisdom and also food for thought, but also a very concrete example about the, 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 the importance of education. And I really took good note of uh, my one point that I will remember, a couple of points obviously, but one is that uh, in Sanskrit when you say that it, the education objective is to provide uh, liberty to its people, to enlighten liberty, uh, liberate people. Uh, this is something that we will, uh, we will, uh, I will, I will bring back to me, but with me. The um, one point that is interesting because in this very room, not so long ago, we were um, celebrating, if I may call it celebration, the memorial of uh, Vinod Renan, who was one of the uh, one of the uh, father of RTE. And if there is one thing in the discussion I was having with him in the last couple of years, if one thing he was saying on and on and on and on was about the right to education is one thing, and the discussion needs to move to right to to learn. And he says. On the only way that we will be able to shift from from uh, enrollment uh, to retain, retaining the, the children in school will be to address the quality of education, that is the learning, uh, teaching and learning okay. achievement. And he, he had one aspect, which is uh, very specific to India, and many countries but mainly India, is that 
quality of education in India will not be addressed if we not if we not address upfront diversity and exclusion. And I think you mentioned that in several of your, of, of your points today. And the whole issue of, of uh, excluded, of, of uh, the issue of lang uh, different languages and so forth is something that will be key to, uh, to the reform, and, and which is needed. And many people ask the question about uh, RTE, which is one of the most, uh, for speaking from a UNICEF perspective, RTE is one of the most um, um, progressive Act, uh, legislation on, on, on education. If you think that uh, you have uh, the right to have proper education from eight to grade eight, this is an entitlement, um, and this is something quite, quite progressive. The, is the discussion that has uh, been taking place, and your point also today, how this is going to take place, and how we are going to be able to uh, to bring back a sense of uh, 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 purpose for the education, and also addressing the issue of. of uh, of quality. Last week, we were we did launch with the Ministry of Hel uh, Minist HRD. We did launch a package called the Child Friendly School Scheme System, which is part of the RTE. And I have seen in several states. We were mentioning states. I have visiting many states in the country over the last couple of years, where people put their mind together. When there is leadership, when there is supportive supervision, when closer to the classroom. Uh, some of the components of the, of the child friendly spaces through um, comprehensive, uh, continuous company evaluation and so forth, it does make a difference. And we have seen in classroom a different approach to pedagogy, a different relationship between parent, uh, teacher, and, and, and children. And if one of the challenges, and I think you mentioned also, is how we are going to be able to, how India is going to be able to bring that to scale, there is a myth that the education uh, private sector elementary is of better quality than than the private sector the, the public sector in that instance uh, the example i'm mentioning to you in rajasthan uh, after one year of in, in implementing child, the uh, cce um, the parents decided 25 percent of the parents decided to take their children out of <coughs> private school back into public school because they yeah. saw that there was a learning achievement they saw a satisfaction from the child, they saw the teachers be, be more committed and involved, and the community started to be involved and so in the embellishment of the school. So we have seen this in action, it's possible, it's happening. Our challenge because it will be, it will be to, to, um, to scale this up uh, because there's so many children where I don't want to bore you with figures, so many children who are still out of school right now, who are dropping out more, on almost 50% 50, 50 before completion of mm -hmm. grade eight. And I just want to leave you with one thought. I was discussing with the, the Minister of HRD last night, and I said, you know, Madam, after two, two years in India, looking at the, what India has accomplished and so forth, uh, I was saying one of the things I've been mentioning in many forms is, is just think of India the day where all of its children will have achieved 12 years of reasonable good education. Just imagine where India is going to be. And she said, this is what keeps me awake at night, but we'll get there. Thank, thank you very thank much. You, thank you. Good thank night. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your wonderful very Thank you. Very thank you. Very thank you. This is, I think the best speech I've heard in India. Okay. Okay. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. He inspired me, so.